Greetings, Quester. The Meddlesome Meeples present Tone Talk with Richard and Matt. And on this Tone Talk, Richard's going to be talking to us about a book by Peter F. Hamilton entitled The Abyss, be- Abyss Beyond Dreams. Yes. And uh, I'd just like to say that yeah. I've just noticed on the cover it's recommended by both the Daily Mail and the Guardian. So I want yeah. to know what kind of freaky work of nature you've got here, Richard. <laughs> well, they can appreciate a good book, like, even though they uh, they argue with each other. And um, yeah, yeah, but it's made just... them agree on something. Yeah, yeah. There are parts of it where because it does get quite political. This book, right? Even though it's politics on another planet, mm-hmm. in basically a different universe. Um, but. You mean you could take different parts of it to uh, support what you wanted, really? It's ah, uh, so that's what they've done. It's pretty well rounded, really. But you know, I think they just appreciate it being a good book, really. Um, now, you were asking if it was part of a, a series, mm-hmm. and it is called like it's the first story, the first book in uh, what they've called the Chronicle of the Fallers. Okay. So there's a big list of all the different series that Peter F. Hamilton has done. Chronicle of the Fallers, this is the only one. <laughs> I've checked, there are more of it, so there are more Chronicle of the Fallers book, but it's um, kind of embedded within other series, right. so um, I could just, I could pick this up quite easily, mm-hmm. because there's lots of expositional lines and dialogue and explanations of what had gone on previously, so I understood the kind of universe this was in, but it was very much a completely different story story. Like starting, so sort of a standalone book within an existing universe. Yeah, and you yeah. don't need to have read any of the other books of the universe to no. follow this one. It did make me quite interested in reading some of them because it's actually the same main character. Okay. Although strangely, it's a clone of him. So this the main character in it, Nigel Sheldon. It just became very obvious that that he was the main one from all these other books. It just speaks about his previous adventures and things mm. like that. He was basically the guy from Earth, who, um, well, he was the first one to set foot on Mars. Okay. But he did it through a portal. So he's like a, a physicist, and um, they made this kind of, basically a wormhole. And, and this, this made is the it... backstory, not the book itself. This is what had happened in previous books, right, apparently. Okay. It's explained here, but uh, yeah, he opened a portal on Earth, stepped out onto Mars, and... I think that was like a massive achievement for humankind, but apparently there was an alien kind of standing there, like laughing at them <laughs> at the time. I'm not sure. I'm not sure kind of how that went down or anything, but they they kind of found out they weren't the only ones in the in the galaxy, and basically this guy, because of like genetics and things like that, he's over a thousand years old mm. now, and um, still looks at like 25, and he is the leader of. The Commonwealth, which is kind of a federation type thing, mostly uh, linked together through wormholes and things like that, but he's managed to kind of make humankind have a inter well interstellar society, mm. um, and it's a bit of a kind of post scarcity thing. And the fact that he is the one having the adventure here, it made me think of Zaphod Beeblebrox quite a lot. Like <laughs> he's actually there, being very hands on, yeah. but also being basically the president of the galaxy and. Yeah, I thought that was quite interesting that he featured so much in this book. But as I say, he's a it was a, a clone of him, and that comes quite early. They like kind of realise that they're going to have to send someone into this mm. void. Um, that Nigel's the best one to go, but also too important to go. So he clones himself with all the memories and then sends that. <laughs> and um, but a lot of it happens on this planet, which is called uh, Bienvenido. And what it is is. It's in a void, and I th- would you say that that's a welcoming planet, Richard? Kind of, yeah. Uh, I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know you know Spanish, but yeah. <laughs> so um, what had happened is, yeah, there you go. There's a, kind of a map of most of it there. So um, what it is is, some people on a sh- on a colony ship got stuck in a void, and now I think this void has been featured before in Peter F. Hamilton's books because there is the Void trilogy you can see here. Now this is basically the black hole in the centre of our galaxy. So in this universe, or this uh, literary universe, that turns out to have some very weird properties and it's Mm. not just a singularity, it is actually a void that's expanding and engulfing 
planets and stuff. When you get in there, the physics are very different. All your ship and all the technology kind of stops working. The humans have kind of nanomachines and stuff mm. like that, so they've got basically telepathy and stuff like that. Oh, well, kind of. It's kind of a uh, it's called a Gaia field, I think. So, like they can sense each other's emotions and things like right. that. Right. Now, when they get and in... that's something that each one projects, is it or? Well, it's kind of it kind of links together. It's like internet on your okay. uh, in nanos, and obviously you can tweak what physical attributes you want to have, things like that. And uh, so everybody looks exactly how they would want to look. So I if... like the sound of that. Yeah, yeah. It, it does. Like towards the beginning of the book, there's a lot of. Uh, talk about how if someone looks uh, if there's any kind of physical kind of imperfection that's kind of a statement like mm. a bold statement uh, that they don't want to conform and things like that um so that's a kind of post-scarcity civilization they're living in and when they get in the void all that stops working but the physics becomes really weird they have telekinesis weird stuff like that mm. um proper telepathy and um yeah basically the technology stops working, but they find they've got basically powers. Hmm. It's some very weird quantum stuff happening in this void. There are aliens in there with them who are bizarre, and they and time is weird as well. So humans get lost in this void and end up having to make a new civilization, basically. And because they can't get out of the void, can't get out, can't no. get back. So this is why this planet gets settled. So. I mean, none of this is kind of spoilers because what I've just explained is basically the prologue. Mm. And um, the bulk of the book is set on this planet that's been settled and then it's like 3,000 years later. Um, they are trying to keep themselves safe from the fallers, which are horrible. It's like these eggs that just fall out of uh, orbit. Mm. And they'll kind of lure you towards them using some kind of psychic link. And if you get stuck on it it will they basically eat you and you become a new they kind of make a copy of you that's basically a faller from then on which will go on to eat but is people. that copy superior uh no oh it there are there are some superiorities but it's not you it is a and, faller yeah but that's I, the trouble i kind of like the idea of a superior version of me not if it just came in through the door and started <laughs> killing everybody but, yeah because that's basically what's happening hang on, hang on. Yeah. which door yeah, the one that you want to escape from. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so basically, yeah, these things are horrible. And obviously, what has happened is a very uneven, aristocratic society has developed on this planet mm -hmm. because the ruling class are using the fear of the fallers to kind of keep themselves in power okay. like you keep need you need to pay us taxes so we protect you from the fallers stuff mm. like that which is almost like a standard military propaganda thing in this it is uh, yeah. in this world isn't it it reminded I mean, me very much it, it was like France before the Res revolution or Russia it's I like think it, when you said that I was thinking like Cold War Russia type that kind of thing uh, or, or North no, Korea no, it, it ends up being more no, that's more later yeah they rule largely by the fear of of the West, they paint the West as yeah, these. Yeah, that kind of thing. Mm. Yeah, but it's it's also like there's no social mobility, mm. that kind of thing. So, and it's it really, if anyone's more... listening to this podcast in North Korea, we're not all like that. There's only one there's person only some ever going to be like listening that. to it. Yeah. <laughs> so, <there's, laughs> who has the ability to listen to podcasts? <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, the, um, so it, it kind of made me feel more like it's like a medieval type of thing, mm. though, because of the way marriages worked things like that like some there'll be alliances between different mm. uh, different families and uh, things like that so so they make kind of like a feudal yeah science it seems more system, feudal yeah. yeah that's it but obviously it, it was sci-fi but now none of the technology works so it basically is like like medieval but they have they have weird kind of genetic engineering that they can do so they've been doing some of that mm. on animals so they've got basically their own mutants that will work for them, stuff like that. So it's a very different type of world. It sounds interesting. It sounds unique. It's very unique. This is why I'm having to explain so much because, um, yeah, it's hard to kind of picture what the main mm. thrust of the book is. Now, this is what I'm getting to now. Most of it is about a revolution mm -hmm. and about planning a revolution. And it made me think of Discworld quite a lot mm -hmm. because 
it's like one of the like you were talking about the Vimes books last week. Um, it's it reminds me of Nightwatch really, and okay. uh, the way that a revolution is brewing, and mm. it's all the planning of it, and uh, like atrocities happening that fuel it, and the fact that they have this telepathy as well, that makes it so much different because there's one point where there's a riot and the police are trying to put it down and a little girl gets shot and you don't know if that was on purpose or whatever it could have just been a stray bullet but everybody gathers around her they're trying to help her and everything and then this image of her gets transmitted from brain to brain um, through this kind of telepathy hmm. makes the riot ten times worse <laughs> it's that that kind of thing can happen wow. on this one and uh, like people are using their telekinesis against the guards the guards have these have having to have these psychic shells around them so yeah it's very different it's like very imaginable on earth mm. happening because that kind of thing has happened but with such different physics and mm. different on a different world and uh, it just changes the game doesn't it it right? does well, yeah not that these things are a game but you know no what I mean. no it's, no yeah it changes the changes way that the... it is and it's just so interesting to see the same kind of issues that have happened on Earth unfolding on a completely mm. different planet. And it's one where humans have started it again in the future. So it's not like this is like an alternate Earth imaginary. This is like we've gone to the stars, we've ended up getting trapped, history has repeated itself. Because there, <laughs> so are, there are some that think that if we were to reach the stars, mm. our problems on Earth would seem insignificant by comparison, therefore yeah. we would solve them. But it's interesting that this is a portrayal of... You know, we've gone out, we've done all that, and we've still taken those same issues with us. Yeah, because unless we it, really, yeah. unless we deal with those issues, they're yeah. never going to go away. Yeah, because basically, we are basically the same still, even yeah. though um, culture changes. And I mean, even with the advance of technology, mm. we are still predominantly following the same psyche yeah. that we that people were two thousand years ago. Oh yeah, yeah, well longer than that. Yeah. I mean, we're still hunter gatherers, really. Yeah, but yeah, so. Um, yeah, the the resolution bit is really interesting, and you get very absorbed mm. in that. Um, it's actually a character called um, Slavasta. It's a hard name to pronounce, actually. He is the main one, like starting this revolution, and uh, there's his wife, um, Bethany. They're both strange names. So it's them two that are kind of do- doing this. Sounds like two different people. His, yeah, his wives, Bethany. Oh yeah, it does actually. Yeah, it makes it sound like that. Yeah, maybe he's onto something. There. I don't know. <laughs> but um, yeah, when Nigel kind of turns up again, this Nigel Sheldon, obviously he's there. They're not really sure where he's from or anything, mm. but he seems to just be in the know about everything and have all this weird mm. technology because he, he's kind of making stuff from scratch. None of his technology works either, but he kind of. Uh, he kind of understands more than they do because he's just come from the Commonwealth, whereas they are on a planet where all this knowledge has been forgotten. Yeah. Like centuries ago. That's why I think there's a kind of a, a weird time thing. That kind of got away from me a little bit. Time is so weird and malleable in the void that mm. I kind of... I think, basically, Sheldon is, like, a th- over a thousand years old, and Nigel Sheldon, and these people that got lost in the void, because time's different there, They've had 3,000 years in there. Mm. So, yeah, it's weird. But anyway, um, this, they have this revolution. Obviously, part of it is about... Do you believe the revolution is to... Yeah. As to who wins and who loses up for... Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not going to do... Obviously, they plan the revolution. I'm not going to say how that went or anything like that. But the part of the planning of the revolution is what you do afterwards right right and they had to they were planning this right from the start like we can't just make it military we have to have some political clout Mm. we have to have people believing in us things like that and i mean that kind of thing can go wrong very easily Mm. and um yeah the nature of the void i kind of got the idea that we're going to learn more about that at the end um because it, it's so weird and you understand so mm. little throughout the book of what what uh, the nature of this void is um, because it's almost like there's religious components to it a little bit because like one of the things that's weird in this quantum is like when someone dies you kind of see like a soul go mm. up and it will either be guided by these sky lords, a type of alien there's these two different uh, you can either go to Jiu which is like a nebula over there 
Mm. Or you can go to Eurakus, which is one over there, which is horrible. It looks horrible and... Kind of like a heaven and hell. Basically, yeah. yeah. So the Sky Lords will either guide you to Giyu, or if you haven't lived a fulfilled life or something. Uh, so you didn't have your head together when you died, basically. You just kind of wander around and you end up in uh, Eurakus, Eurakus, I think they call it. And uh, But the weird thing is... Yeah... I'm not going to say any more about that, but no. that, that us, is the bizarre bit of it, anyway. Tell us what it is about this book that you particularly liked and why you recommend it. I liked the fact that, um, well, as I've mentioned, the political and social mm. elements of it are so interesting and so engrossing. Um, it would work if it was on Earth, I think. Mm. If It's uh, relatable. Yeah, it is very relatable. And yet it is in such a bizarre kind of situation. Mm. Um, where the f- laws of physics are all over the place, and yeah, you, you kind of really want them to get back into this, into the proper universe mm. with all its amazing technology and everything. And uh, yeah, you're kind of really rooting for for Nigel and the others. Um, and I kind of look forward to seeing more about what the fallers actually are because they were kind of a boogeyman in mm. this, basically. It was all to do with people's fear of the fallers mm. rather than the fallers themselves. So, but this being the chronicle of the fallers, I mean, I think there's going to be a lot more about them. Yeah. So, yeah, we're looking forward to see. But I found this very interesting as a place to start mm. reading Peter F. Hamilton's books. I think because it did feature Nigel Sheldon, who was obviously one of the main characters from his stories, and yet it was kind of him starting a new lot of adventures. Yeah. I think that was quite a nice place to start. I'm not sure whether or not I do want to go and read from the beginning or just carry on from here. I may well just carry on from here, actually, and just kind of look up what happened in the others, but I'll have to see. Definitely, it's worth reading, I, I think. Yeah. I don't know anything about this book, but from what you said, it does sound interesting. Mm-hmm. The What does appeal to me about this, first of all, is the, um, the artwork. I really like the art on the cover. Uh, it's interesting as well, because we were saying just before we started recording that this is probably the most recent book yeah. that we've we've ever talked it's like about. It's like three years old. <laughs> it's like three years old, and most of ours is, you know, like 20, 30 years <laughs> yeah. ago. I mean, we've, we've done books from the 1930s. So, yeah, yeah, basically, yeah, yeah. So it is definitely the most recent mm. one. But this is one Richard recommends. Yeah, definitely. Peter F. Hamilton, The Abyss Beyond Dreams. Farewell, Questa. To find out about other productions by the Meddlesome Meeples, then check out our channel or rendezvous with us at meddlesomemeeples.com. Until next time, Questa, farewell and keep thine axe sharp.